to market domination. I'm Julie Hyman. That's Josh Lipton. Live from our New York City headquarters, we are giving you the ultimate investing playbook to help tune out the noise and make the right moves for your money. And here's your headline blitz getting you up to speed one hour before the closing bell rings on Wall Street. The fact that inflation is proving stickier, particularly in some of the services categories, is somewhat indicative of the fact that the real economy is also looking stronger. We saw job growth accelerate throughout Q1. We've seen consumer spending accelerate as well. When we look at our own spending pulse data, we are seeing greater spending into March. June's just a little bit too soon for them to, to, to be cutting rates. So we're now looking more like July. The market has certainly priced that in. Today's data is is not soft enough to, to change that narrative by any means, but it, it but it, it is a little bit more you know, a positive signal in terms of at least getting a little bit more progress on that front. It's not going to be convincing enough by June, but by July, we think there's a decent chance that the Fed could actually be cutting. Generative AI is a huge investment party for organizations. We're actually seeing generative AI moving from pilot and use cases to actual implementation of businesses now. What they're seeing is they're saying, look, if I'm not using AI, I'm not going to be competitive. So they're, they're seeing a connection between their future competitiveness and the use of some of these tools. We've got one hour to go until the market close. Let's take a look at the major averages and how we got to our current levels. In fact, we're seeing a rebound across the board for the major averages. Here's the Dow starting off up about 95 points right now after trading lower for much of the session, making a round trip now higher by about a quarter of 1%. We did get that PPI data this morning, wholesale inflation coming in not as bad as had been feared here, still showing an acceleration or still showing an increase, but not a reacceleration like we saw in terms of some of the consumer prices here. Uh, looking at the S&P 500 up nine tenths of 1%, it too obviously rebounding. And then the NASDAQ is really leading things here up by more than one and a half percent. And I wanted to zoom in on large cap technology. Here is our heat map of the NASDAQ 100. Now, the first thing you'll notice here is there's a lot of green on this screen. I only counted, I think, about a dozen stocks that are down in the NASDAQ 100. So a broad-based gains within this particular sub-index. And then, got to point out the action that we are seeing in the largest cap tech names here. Amazon is trading at a new record, up 1.8% today. And that builds on the gains it's been seeing this year, up 25% a year to date. So that's one to note. The other to note that we're going to dig into a little bit later is Apple, which, of course, is down year to date, but seeing that rebound in today's session up about 3.6%. There was some reporting on new uh, updates to Max that came out earlier. Also, a positive note out from Bank of America. Again, we're going to dig into that, but shows you that rebound that we're seeing. And then we've got NVIDIA up by 3%, Meta up less so, but still participating in this rally. And then uh, Alphabet and Microsoft also trading higher. So that has a lot to do with helping to power the rally. Quickly as well, want to take a look at the sector action here because we've got energy and financials and health are still in the red, but it is that tech sector, the XLK, up 1.9%, and communication services up 1% that are really the standouts in today's session. Josh? Stocks higher today after cooler than expected reading on producer prices ease some investor concerns that the Fed may not begin cutting rates till later in the year. And that's exactly how our first guest today thinks it is going to play out. Let's welcome in Rick Reeder, BlackRock's Chief Investment Officer of Global Fixed Income. Rick, it is always good to have you on the show. Let's start with that inflation reading, Rick. March PPI came in below <laughs> consensus. Interest, Rick, just to get your take. Um, what did you make of that, of that report, Rick? And what do you think Jay Powell makes of it? So I think the markets took a uh, took a deep breath on today's report and, uh, and and got some satisfaction around. You know, yesterday's report was concerning to the market. I mean, it's you know it's interesting when you actually take PPI. It's a big component in the get into what gets into the Fed's thinking around core PCE, and this gives you a bit of comfort around uh, around those numbers. You know, which we think you know are going to settle in around the 2.6, 2.7% level for core PCE. So I think part of why the equity market is, uh, has gotten a bit of relief today is on the back side of it. Listen, the data yesterday in CPI was concerning, but it's really the service sector that is really uh, seeing this sort of level of inflation, which is hard for the Fed to bring down, and a question of how much are they going to fight that over the coming months. Well, that is the big question of how much they're going to fight that, right? Because we've had some of your peers on yeah. the street, including folks at Deutsche Bank, Bank of America now, coming out today and saying, 
only one cut is going to happen this year. Where are you in terms of your number of cuts? Where are you guys? <clears throat> So I'd say a couple of things. I'd say I think the Fed would like to still get a couple of cuts in. I mean, if you break down where that inflation comes from, you know, look at things like insurance, healthcare, education. They're not terrible. I mean, those are primary drivers of where it's I mean, they're not cyclical. They're not influenced by the interest rate. And what's happening is you're creating a tax on lower income, a tax on local banks because the rate is so high today. I still think they'd like to get a couple in. Listen, I wouldn't argue with is the number today you're only going to get one or two cuts in for 2024. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a reasonable possibility. But, you know, we got to see the data over the next couple of months. Our sense is you'll see start to see some better inflation data over the next couple of months. That'll give the Fed a window. And I quite frankly, I th think they'd like to see that window. When you have funds rate that's five and three, I said, you have a core PCE at two, six, two, you know, let's say it only is two, six, two, seven. It doesn't get down to two and a half you're still very restrictive and, and putting pressure on parts of the economy, probably unduly. You know, there are, though, given the inflation reports we've gotten here over the last few months, there has a question been raised about whether the Fed did enough, that they should have hiked more. What's your response to that? So I don't, I don't buy that at all. In fact, I, in fact, I think once you get the funds rate to a certain level, and you know, we could debate is that level 4% or 5%, or once you get into, obviously, it's the real rate of interest, again, where inflation is, I don't think the Fed can do much on the service sector of the economy the, that is not terribly cyclical. But what it does, it creates a pernicious impact on the, on parts of the economy where we talk about small business, local banks, et cetera. And it's a question of how much do you want to create a skewed, distorted economy to try and get at something that is very difficult to get at. So I don't I don't agree with that at all. I think we'll see inflation come down over time. And really what the Fed should be concerned about, it's price stability. It's not a number. Price stability in the economy generally is pretty good. There are parts of it, auto insurance, health care, health insurance, et cetera, that are too high. But uh, but it's not because of a cyclical impulse. So, no, I don't agree at all that they should have gone more. In fact, I don't I don't think you get that much of an impact. By the way, using the balance sheet is also an effective tool that they, they utilize. And you've also said a couple of times here, 2.6, 2.7% is sort of the you know the end rate here and, and if we get price stability at 2.6 2.7 is that going to be good enough for the fed is that what you think we're going to we're looking at for the long term here so i think there's a couple of things you know that you know it's interesting listening to the discussion before about ai and you think about what ai is and by the way you think about why corporate earnings have been so good it's companies becoming more efficient more productive I think you're going to see an increase in productivity. By the way, you talk about how companies are becoming more productive and how going forward, how much labor do you utilize, how, how much SG&A do you utilize in your balance sheet. The reason why corporate earnings are good is they're being able to bring down costs because they're being more efficient. I think we're going to learn a lot over the next year or two. How much that does that AI assimilate into the economy and allow for costs to come down? So longer term, I think it's when people project where longer term inflation is going to be, there are so many factors, global trade, et cetera, that factor in it. I think the only thing you could do today is say, gosh, we're running a bit higher inflation. I'm an investor, so what do I do? You can create income in portfolios that is extraordinary because you don't have to go out the yield curve. You can create six and a half, seven percent yielding portfolios in fixed income. And and uh, and by the way, and own equities, which are not actually interest rate sensitive. You take the top seven, ten companies in the S&P 500, they're not big borrowers to fund their business. So I think you can create a really good portfolio, a really efficient portfolio in today's economy with uh, with that in mind. And then you know, where inflation goes 12 months, 18 months from now, two years from now, I think it's, it's hard to figure out. Rick, I'm just looking at the tenure here. We're at four, five, seven. Near to any immediate term, Rick, where do you think we head? So I think by the end of the year, that number is coming down. I think the 10-year note will come lower. I think alongside of some better inflation number, closer to the Fed bringing, that, bringing the rate down. But I think it's in a range. And I think what you have to assume in a, in a portfolio today, 10-year longer-term interest rates could be a bit higher for a period of time. But you're creating, per the earlier comment, like you don't need to go out that long. You get so much yield in the three, four, five, two, three, four, five-year part of the curve. Things like investor credit, uh, great credit, et cetera. My sense is the rate, that ten-year rate will come down, but it could certainly, if we don't get corroborative data on inflation coming down, you could trend a little bit higher from uh, from where we are today. Certainly in long-end interest rates. And um, you know, what what do you think is sort of the level that we're going to see that ten-year yield get to? So, I mean, I th I still think you're going to see. 
the 10 year get down to four and a quarter, 4% um, over as the year progresses alongside of what we think will be, uh, will be better data. But I listen, I wouldn't write off that you can move a bit higher from here in the interim. Again, I'm much more focused on let's build durable portfolios with income because, you know, today the Treasury's got to issue an awful lot of debt. Inflation is staying stickier or high. I just want to cre keep creating income more in on the yield curve. Rick, for fixed income investors, investors who are listening right now, what would you avoid, Rick? So we've talked about long end interest rates. I think our, uh, you know, why do you need them? You know, you know, usually when you're a lender, when you're buying fixed income, when you're a lender, you usually have to go out the yield curve to take more risk to get more yield. You actually don't have to do that at all today. I don't know why. I don't think we need to do a lot there in uh, in today's environment. The other thing that I think is extraordinary about about today's dynamic, you don't need to stretch into things like weaker high yield. You don't need to stretch into weaker parts of emerging markets. You can buy quality assets. Now, I run a uh, ETF called uh, called Bink, where uh, you know we're using a lot of high quality assets with an average rating of high triple B, and we're still able to create what's close to seven percent. I just don't think in an economy that's going to moderate a bit. Uh, that you need to really stretch into highly volatile assets today. Today, I just think clip a lot of coupon, clip a lot of yield, keep your risk in the equity market, which I still think equities are going higher. I think keep your risk in the equity market where you've got you've got some real upside alongside of you know companies cutting costs, keeping margins, and throwing off a lot of a lot of ROE, a lot of return on equity. I, I keep your risk there today. Yeah, Rick, I was going to ask you about that. If you if the, what you were saying about risk went for equities as well, you mentioned a few moments ago that if you look at the largest companies in the S and P 500, they're throwing off a lot of cash. They have some of these characteristics you're looking for. I mean, that sounds sounds a little fangy again to me, or Magnificent Seven, <laughs> or whatever you want to call it. Is that so, what you're talking about? So that's that was so we it's been a minute on it. If you said today, so if you take I think it's the, the top 12 of the top 22 companies, the S&P 500, throw off return on equity over 30%. Six of them throw off return on equity over 60. That is extraordinary. If you can build a book value for equity that and that accelerated a fashion, it's pretty hard for the equity market to go up. Plus, they're also buying back a load of their stock uh, simultaneously. So it's pretty powerful from that. So. Yes, I like. I still like tech. You know, you evolve parts of, of tech where you go to. A, there's some parts of software tangential to uh, to AI that that I like quite a bit. Healthcare, I think you're going to see continue to see tremendous innovation in healthcare. By the way, the energy sector, uh, which I think is taking a little bit of a dip today, the energy sector shows off real free cash flow generation makes a lot of sense. And then experiences, airlines, <clears throat> some of the hotel, casino. I think the world is shifting. And you're seeing, you know, by the way, why is goods inflation negative, actually negative in the three months, six months moving average is negative. Why is service inflation higher? Things like arts and entertainment, et cetera, experiences. And I think orienting your portfolio in some of those spaces as well will continue to continue to be well supported. Yeah, we heard some of that commentary from the likes of Delta CEO along with their earnings. Uh, Rick Reeder, oh it's always great to see you. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Well, Sam Bankman Freed is looking to appeal his 25 year prison sentence and conviction for fraud. The FTX founder filing the notice of appeal just about two weeks after the sentencing came down. But as of right now, it's unclear on what grounds he intends to appeal. Judge Lewis Kaplan did impose a shorter sentence than prosecutors asked for, but it wasn't as small as what SBF's team obviously was asking for. So this was expected, but still, it'll be interesting to see. What exactly the argument they make is? Yeah, his argument has always been, well, I made mistakes, but I didn't. So I didn't purposely, deliberately defraud. That obviously did not convince judge and jury. But we'll see what he argues this time. Yeah, we will, and we'll see if he is successful. But I believe he uh, requested to stay in a particular prison in Brooklyn, pending all of this. Um, making its way, continuing to make its way. Yeah, the in course. terms of time, time, at least the reports that I'm reading really said it could be many months before I was right. going to hear this. Yep. Yeah, so we'll keep you posted. We're just getting started here on market domination. Coming up, Apple shares soaring on the news they plan to overhaul the Mac lineup with new AI-focused M4 chips. We'll check in on the tech giant later in the hour. Plus, we're joined by a Boeing analyst to discuss the latest pressures mounting on the airplane manufacturer. And mortgage rates moving toward 7% again as markets digest the latest data. We're going to break down the latest housing hurdles in the 4 p.m. hour. All that and more when market domination returns.
Boeing facing a Senate subcommittee next week on the growing safety concerns plaguing the company. And this comes as the embattled airplane manufacturer searches for its next chief executive officer. Joining us to discuss is Robert Springarn. He's Milius Research Managing Director and Research Analyst for the Aerospace Defense and Space Sector. So obviously, Rob, it doesn't feel like the pressure on Boeing is letting up. Let's talk briefly about that committee hearing next week. What what do you think we could learn new, if anything, out of that hearing? And what does a sort of best case scenario look like for Boeing? Well, I think the best case scenario is going to rely on a lot more than just what happens next week. You know, we may learn some new details from the whistleblower or, the, or those who testify next week. And it's clear, it, you know, it's important that there's government oversight here, that they're asking questions and turning up the pressure, so to speak. And we've seen, I think, uh, incremental response from Boeing, and it's going to continue. And Rob, I'm just curious, um, you, listen, you know the company backwards and forwards. What do you make of the job Calhoun has actually done, sort of navigating the company through this crisis? What, what grade do you give him, Rob? You know, it, it's, it goes back to culture. We've talked about culture a lot with this company, and unfortunately, all of the executives, I think, have uh, been disserviced, if you will, by the movement of Boeing's headquarters out of Seattle in the early 2000s and to Chicago and, and, and now Northern Virginia. And so there's a, there's a bit of a um, distance between the factory floor and the executives. And I think that uh, Dave Calhoun, it, 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 you know, maybe he didn't have all the information he needed. The question is, you know, how could he improve that? I think the message is getting through. Unfortunately, it's taken a long time. We've had a lot of incre incremental movement and response in that message. You get the sense that we're at the point where the changes are gonna be more significant than they have in the past, especially when you're changing the management team, or you're changing the people at the top of the company. Rob, do you think Calhoun will make it to the end of the year? <laughs> I don't know that he necessarily will, but it's not, I don't know that it's because of anything that happens at Boeing. I think there's a chance they may select the CEO before the end of the year and then the timing would be sooner. Who should take the reins, Rob, in your opinion? Any, any candidates? Well, I, you know, we here at Mealy has actually downgraded the stock uh, a couple, you know, about 10 days ago because we just felt the overhangs were too significant for the stock to work in the meantime while they're looking for a manager, you know, replacing uh, Dave Calhoun uh, while they're waiting to ramp up on their production. You know, one of one of the folks that I think would be a very good candidate is Pat Shanahan, former uh, 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 acting secretary of defense and somebody with a 30 year career at Boeing prior to that. I also mentioned in one of my recent notes that an out-of-the-box choice could be somebody like SpaceX C COO, Gwynne Shotwell. You need somebody with an engineering background, with a production floor experience, program management. So not you don't want a salesperson, you don't want a finance person, and a, and a bunch of the other suggestions have focused in those areas. I don't think that's the right answer. Obviously, this would be a very challenging position for any of these folks to take on. So it's not just finding the right person, it's convincing them to take the job, right? Do you think that the, the idea of taking on this challenge would be something that would be appealing to some of these folks? I think so, I, but I don't, I don't know personally. The two people I mentioned, I haven't spoken to. I don't know what their interest level would be. So this is based in, in, in Pat Shanahan's case. I, I, I know him, but it's been some time. That said, I, I would imagine the company is very important to him. He, of course, is the acting CEO at Spirit Aerosystems, which is involved in a lot of this right now. Um, so I think there, there's a possibility. I, again, I mentioned Gwen Shotwell. You know, it, it, it's probably a big ask to have her leave something like a SpaceX. One of the things that folks do uh, look for when they change roles at the CEO level is where is the stock? Is the stock near a bottom? And then, therefore, if I can get in there and do what I need to do and improve the company, can I benefit from an increase in the stock? And so that might be appealing to some folks who are out there. And Rob, finally, I just wanted to switch gears while we're talking about leadership and ask you about another stock in your coverage, and that's Hexel, which just mm -hmm. announced that the, unexpectedly, that the former CEO of Spirit Aerosystems, uh, Tom Gentile, was going to take over and its CEO. This was not gre greeted very enthusiastically by the street, to put it lightly. What do you make of that move, and is that a mistake? 
I think I, I, I know both companies fairly well. I know both CEOs well. Um, I, I do think it was a surprise to the market since Tom Gentile recently left Spirit Aero Systems and the problems there were similar to Boeing. There were operational issues on the factory floor, execution missteps, if you will. And uh, unfortunately, folks are gonna look at Tom through that lens. He's a very uh, capable person. Uh, I, I, you know, I've worked with him for many, many years. He, he um, I think he understands the industry extremely well. This is a little bit different. You know, he's going from an aerostructures or fuselage assembly company to a material a materials uh, science company, if you will. Hexel manufactures carbon uh, fiber composites that go into those structures. So it's a little bit of a different um, type of work, but he's he's familiar with those things. But understandably, after what's happened at Spirit, and he did preside over much of it, there will be some questions as to whether that was the right choice. Rob, great insight and perspective. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming on the show. Pleasure. Thank you. Check it in on another call of the day. DoorDash, catch an upgrade to buy over at Moffitt Nathanson. Michael Morton, the analyst on the note, also raising his price target on DoorDash to 164. So uh, Moffitt Nathanson, bullish again, Julie. The issue is they thought there was risk from student loans, um, but it didn't happen, didn't actually materialize. Instead, the analyst saying, listen, his checks actually indicating that DoorDash is gaining share and also an increasing rate of adoption he has for grocery delivery too, argues he thinks they're gonna take share from Instacart. Yeah, and this was interesting because it's sort of a mea culpa here um, saying that the student loan risks that he, he had anticipated did not in fact come to pass here. Um, overall, talking about U.S. restaurant delivery, um, he's saying some investor skepticism is remaining in terms of the ability to grow order frequency, mm -hmm. how, how often you order. Um, but he said there is still ample opportunity in the space more broadly here. Um, and in addition to DoorDash, uh, in grocery, that Amazon and Walmart are also going to mm -hmm. sort of team up, not literally team up, but combined we'll take share from Instacart. Yeah, uh, he says here, we've always loved DoorDash's long-term growth story. We were worried about short-term headwinds. We were, in retrospect, too cute by half, Julie. Mm. That's where it comes down. Coming up, Bank of America turning bullish on Nike, upgrading that company to a buy rating. We're gonna speak to the analysts behind the call on the other side.
Shares of Nike getting a boost thanks to an upgrade from Bank of America to buy from neutral. The analyst saying it's time to get off the sidelines with several key catalysts on the horizon, including Investor Day and the upcoming Summer Olympics. Joining us now is the analyst behind that call, Bank of America Securities Senior Retail Analyst Lorraine Hutchinson. Lorraine, it is great to see you. So you take Nike to a buy, Lorraine, in part. You say valuation here looks attractive at these levels. You also say estimates finally look achievable. How come, Lorraine? Yeah, look, when you look at consensus for 2025, the estimates have come down by 35%. So I, I think when I see consensus of $4 for 25, 4 50 for 26, I think that's a really achievable bar. You know, Nike growing over the long term at a mid single digit top line with some modest margin expansion is appropriate and really achievable in my view. Um, they have made some mistakes to get those num to bring those numbers from so high to so low. But I think they're finally admitting the mistakes and really taking some bold steps to fix them. So we think with consensus estimates starting to bottom, it's really an interesting time to start looking at the stock on the long side. Now, one of the strategy shifts that they're making, Lorraine, has to do with their Jordan strategy, right? And it, it, this includes sort of making them more available. Now, that ha it's a tricky line to toe, right? Because they want to make them more available so that people can buy them but they don't want to make them a commodity. So how do they do that, and do you think they'll be successful? Yeah, look, it, it is a tricky, it's, it, it's a tricky thing to do, and what they're trying to do is make Jordan slightly more accessible to the masses. So they'll still have, you know, a sold out hot product drop, but they'll also launch some product that will sell at a slightly more accessible price point. Uh, it's a tough thing for a brand to do, and, you know, in fact, there's only really one brand I've ever seen do this well, and it's Nike. Um, in the core Nike brand, they have some really high-end product, and then they also have some product in the family channel. What they've done well is they've stratified it, and they've been sure to put a lot of marketing dollars and a lot of innovation behind the high end. So they've been able to have a very broad reach with the existing brand. I think they're looking to do this for, for Jordan as well. You know, Lorraine, Sam Poser, the analyst, you know, he's covered this sector and, and Nike a long time. He recently downgraded Nike to a sell. Um, and in part, Lorraine, he really went after Nike leadership in, in that note, said financial goals, in fact, are leading merchandising decisions, said many of those driving the direction of the company are using spreadsheets rather than the educated gut. But I guess you, you obviously, you disagree with that, Lorraine. Well, look, I think, you know, this last quarter, they finally came out and proactively took estimates down. So that was the first time I've really seen them do that. They came out and they said first half of fiscal 25 sales will be down. And it's because we're purposefully removing units from the market so they don't get stale. Uh, that, to me, is a very healthy thing to do. And it's a very good thing to do. But look, over the past few years, the performance has not been good. And when I look at how this management team has been compensated, if you think about their fiscal 2023 goals, it was split into three topics, revenue growth, EBIT growth, and digital growth. So they were trying to dictate the way the consumer buys their product by putting such a huge goal in their compensation structure to get them over to digital. The consumer will buy where they wanna buy, right? So I think what's happening now is they're pivoting back to say, if you wanna come into wholesale and try on those shoes before you buy them, we don't mind. However way you wanna buy Nike, we're happy with it. I think the compensation structure has normalized to take that digital metric out. And I think that's a really big sign that they're letting the consumer decide again rather than trying to dictate it. And then we began the conversation by saying there are some upcoming catalysts for Nike. One of them is the Olympics, which traditionally has given uh, the company a boost. Sort of combine that exogenous uh, catalyst with how you think Nike is going to capitalize on it with some of these new strategies. Sure. So Nike's great at capturing moments. Uh, the Olympics are a great example of this. So what they're doing actually yesterday and today in Paris is launching a significant amount of innovation around the Olympics. And so what, what we expect is that newness and innovation to hit. And we anticipate a lot of marketing and demand creation spending in their first quarter ahead of the Olympics. Uh, when we look back, Olympic quarters have, been, have grown about 500 basis points above a regular 1Q. 
uh, because of all this effort, all this product. So I think it's a really exciting time for Nike, and I think they will try to capitalize on that moment by really bringing the innovation. And, and that ties into the broader strategy, which is admission and acknowledgement that they have not been fast enough or bold enough with their innovation, and really you know, moving toward launching more of it. They've cut, they've planned to cut about $2 billion of expenses out of their cost structure and then reinvest almost all of it right back in. So that'll happen over the course of a few years. But I think this big push for the Olympics is one of the first things that we'll see as they really focus on trying to heighten the newness. Right. And the share's up about 3.5% today. Lorraine, thank you. Thanks. Let's check in on some of today's other top trending tickers. Taking a look at the EV space, Ford fueling the EV price war as it offers a rebate incentive, particularly trying to put a target on Tesla. Our Pra Subramanian joins us now to discuss a, a little bit of a different strategy here from Ford, I guess. Yeah, you know, um, manufacturers use these discounts or conquest type rebates uh, here and there. Let's say, for example, Ford will say, uh, if you get a, a competitor, like a broad competitor's uh, pickup, we'll give you a discount on our pickup. But in this case, they actually targeted a specific manufacturer in Tesla, able to confirm with the Ford dealer that they're going to give you 1500 bucks if you're a current Tesla owner uh, for a, a Mustang Mach-E or a Ford Lightning, right? So the, the two big EV offerings that Ford has. Um, not, it's not a huge amount of money, but, but basically you don't have to actually trade the car. And you just got to say that I actually lease or own a 2008 or older Tesla, like not even a recent one, and they'll give you the money. And it could be for anyone in your household too. So kind of a interesting take here on, on really targeting Tesla, not just saying any EV, but Tesla in particular. Mm. I think there's, there's a reason why. I think they want to go after that EV enthusiast or that person who's really kind of forward in their EV thinking. They want to get those guys in into their Ford kind of universe and they'll pay up for it. Mm. Yeah. What is just broadly... Praz, what is Ford's EV strategy at this point? You know, it's been changing a lot. You know, just, yeah. just last week they said they, they pushed back some of their uh, pr uh, plant build out and some of their products they pushed out from 2025 to 2027. These are these second generation f uh, EVs that they think will be more efficient and cheaper to make and just a better overall um, sort of financial kind of experiment for Ford. Mm. So I think that's the goal, but at the, at the same time, they, they're still pushing these Gen 1 EVs and they're going to be losing about five to five and a half billion dollars this year in their Model E business. So I can't imagine that they're going to be saving money doing this. This is the exact opposite. But maybe they've already budgeted some of this stuff in that. Mm, interesting. All right. Thank you, Braz. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Moving on, Apple reportedly preparing to overhaul its entire Mac line with AI-focused M4 chips. This is according to Mark Gurman over there at Bloomberg, Julie. So um, it was actually interesting because there was a couple different headlines today really uh, about Apple. And what connected them was, was Apple's big switch to in-house chips, right, which that, that started in, in uh, around 2010. It has been a very successful strategy for Tim Cook's company. So Bank of America was out with a note today, too, and that's what they were drilling on. Investors are underestimating Apple's margins. B of A says they're going to move higher. On the, and in part, they say, like, on the product side, because Apple's now doing more with in-house chips, they think Apple's going to do its own modem as well. They see that as a, as a tailwind. Same is true for this Bloomberg story on the Mac. Bloomberg reporting, listen, Apple's looking to overhaul the Mac line. New family of in-house AI processors on the way. It also feels like the investors are desperate to hear something from Apple on anything AI, on more clarity around the AI. So if the idea is, is that these chips will put more AI capabilities mm -hmm. into the Macs, maybe that's sort of the, the catalyst that they were hungering for. Even, you know, even if we still don't know exactly when it's happening, the Bloomberg report says could roll out later this year or has been confirmed uh, by the company. But still, you know, with the stock down about, what, 10% this year, mm -hmm. This was enough to give a pop today that is the biggest one that we've seen going back to last May. Um, and so it's been a while since we've seen a move in Apple like this, even as all, uh, many of its peers the, among large cap tech have been moving higher on a daily basis by much bigger it's, amounts. It's why there's now so much, I think, attention and focus on WWDC, which is Apple's big mm -hmm. software in June, and really people expecting 
uh, Tim Cook and their software chief, Craig Federighi, take the stage. And investors, at least bulls, are hoping they're really going to wow them with some AI announcements. Yeah, we'll see. We will. Let's talk about one other mover here as Vertex Pharmaceuticals enters into a definitive agreement to acquire Alpine Immune Sciences. Now, this is a deal that has a total equity value about $4.9 billion. Um, it is Vertex's largest buy ever, and it's interesting that its shares as the acquirer are moving higher. $65 a share is what it's paying, which is 67% higher than Alpine's close on Tuesday. So this is quite a... Uh, premium that the company is paying. Yeah, and importantly, it was interesting, Joe. I saw um, the team over at William Blair being quoted as saying, you know, the product could have applications beyond this specific kidney disease. Mm -hmm. And so they were saying, you know, they were arguing their clients potentially becoming a multi billion dollar product. Um, also, Bloomberg, I thought this was going to point out, this is part of kind of this broader trend that we're kind of seeing mm -hmm. in the sector, they said, of just big dr drug makers kind of increasingly interested in those smaller biotech players that are working on, you know, specifically kidney therapies. Yeah, and, and um, RBC's Gregory Renza had an interesting phrase for this, pipeline in a product deals. In other words, acquiring a single product that could have potentially multiple applications. And so you're not just buying one drug, you're buying one drug that could potentially have multiple uses. Uh, one other quick note here, um, Vera Therapeutics or Vera Therapeutics is also um, developing drugs to treat an autoimmune disease that affects the liver and its shares were also higher today. Mm. You tend to see that sort of halo effect when you get yep. a deal like this. All right. U.S. producer prices rising less than expected in March. The softer data comes on the heels of a hotter than expected inflation print on consumer prices. Jack Kleinheins, the National Retail Federation chief economist, joining us now. Uh, Jack, it is good to see you. So may maybe we'll start there, Jack. We did get you know an, another important inflation print today, March PPI. Just I'm interested, Jack, um, the trajectory of inflation. Where do you see it? Where we are? Where we're headed? And what does it mean for consumers? Uh, well, thank you uh, for having me today, Josh and Julie. Um, certainly, uh, the, the inflation information that came out yesterday just created more uncertainty about where the Fed's going to go in terms of its uh, uh, changes in, public, uh, in monetary policy. Uh, uh, the certainty, though, is that it remains the number one problem for, for households and consumers. Um, uh, actually, uh, from, the, from a retail standpoint, We've seen a tremendous deceleration in retail prices over this past year. Uh, I look at the personal consumption expenditure index, and if you look at it on a year-over-year -year basis for the last two months, uh, retail prices in general have been down almost 1%, again, on a year-over-year -year basis. So uh, I think what we're seeing in many ways is uh, the inflation pressure is still in the service industry, not so much in the goods industry. And what effect is this eventually going to have on spending? I mean, the one report that caught our attention out yesterday from the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia found that uh, credit card delinquency rates in the U.S., the highest on record. What tends to happen, or is that sort of a forward indicator of spending? Uh, well, uh, delinquencies are up. Uh, we've been watching it closely. Um, they seem to be concentra concentrated, though, at the low end of the income spectrum. Uh, and for younger people, um, it is a concern, a concern to be watched. But overall, uh, the balance sheets of uh, the households are in pretty good shape. Um, they have the income. They look pretty good in terms of uh, uh, the growth in income. Uh, the amount of uh, debt they're servicing is still well within uh, reason based on their wherewithal. Um, so I think it's just sort of a, an issue that we're going to have to watch closely and it's concentrated really uh, in only really a, a small portion of the uh, the income uh, 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 spectrum. You know, Jack, when we heard retailers reported earnings, one theme that emerged, at least some uh, of those companies, when on their conference calls, you would hear the execs talking about maybe a shift here, consumers more focused on, on what they need rather than what they want. Is that what you're seeing in the data? Yeah, I'm, there, I mean, there's no doubt about it. I think that there has been a... Uh, an evolution from where we were a couple of years ago. Um, and I think they're just uh, being smart shoppers. Uh, again, I, I believe that the household is in pretty good shape uh, because they feel pretty secure about their jobs. They will continue to spend. Uh, but in terms of the things that they need, 
Um, it's also the things that they need that have um, higher prices and uh, not so much in the retail world. As I've just mentioned, it's the service industries that are, are causing a real headache for households. Uh, their cost of uh, medical care, insurance on cars, um, all those um, service uh, service prices that we've seen in the CPI that have gone up, uh, that's really a ma major headache for households. Is it's obvious to you, uh, but it, it does uh, it does wear thin over in the retail sector because uh, there's going to be a trade-off uh, on spending. Uh, uh, let's just say for discretionary retail goods versus non-discretionary. And Jack, um, Ulta Beauty recently got some attention for sort of seeming to indicate that demand is slowing. Do you think, A, that could be a sort of canary in the coal mine, and B, is that a factor of what you're talking about, you know, sort of households moving around budgets and reprioritizing? Well, I can't comment specifically on, the, on, the, uh, on that report, but I can just tell you that we were, or we are expecting a slower pace of consumer spending uh, going into 2024 uh, because we feel like uh, the organic growth in jobs aren't going to be as strong uh, in the economy. And if you have slower job growth, less income, there's less spending. Uh, and so we're really kind of looking at the dynamic of the broader economy as it relates to, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the retail industry. Uh, and of course, we've got to be careful too and recognize when we give you the numbers on uh, retail spending, for instance, we're looking at growth between two and a half and three and a half percent uh, for 2024. Um, uh, it's nominal dollars, not real dollars. So uh, we have seen considerable price decri declines, like I mentioned. So there is there is growth, uh, unit growth. It's just going to be clouded a little bit because of uh, of how inflation is impacting our, our retail prices. Jack, thanks so much for your time today. Appreciate it. Great to see you. Thank you. Thanks. The recent market downturn sparked by surprisingly hot inflation data could open up opportunities for folks to buy on the dip. We're going to discuss next in our investor playbook.
surprising inflation data this week has complicated the path ahead for the Federal Reserve. It's now becoming a question of if, perhaps not when, interest rates interest rate cuts will come in 2024. And we're looking at how to navigate the big picture with the Yahoo Finance playbook. Joining us now, Kara Murphy, Kestra Investment Management CIO, and Ivana Delevska, Spear Invest founder and CIO. Ladies, thanks so much for being here. Appreciate it. Um, Kara, let's start with you. And on yes, we've had the hotter CPI print, a little bit more reassuring perhaps on the PPI front. But you know, if you're looking at the possibility that at the very least cuts are going to get pushed back, we might not get as many. We might not get any. How do you think about then positioning if that is the case? So if you think about where the market's been so far this year, we have the S&P 500 up about 10% so far this year. And in the meantime, Fed expectations for cuts have gone from seven cuts at the end of last year to, what, one or two today? Normally, you would think that would take a lot of wind out of the sails of equities. But as that's happened, economic growth has been stronger. Corporate earnings have been stronger. So, there, so what we're finding is that there's some really good fundamental underpinning for the strength in equities. So yes, it might be a bit of a disappointment that we don't get the Fed rate cuts. But the fact is, the economy just doesn't need it. And so stocks are doing just fine on their own and don't need that little bit of extra help from the Fed. And Ivana, bring you in here as well. It's interesting, Ivana, because there was a point where I remember Apollo's Torsten Slock says no no cuts this year. And, and, and there was a point where Torsten kind of almost seemed like he was on an island. But we've had this drumbeat now, more economists and strategists kind of joined that camp. Ed Yardeni this week said now no cuts. That's his base case. Can the market move higher even if we get no cuts this year? I think it can. I think the focus is going to shift to earnings as we get into the second half of the year. And we see earnings that really bottomed last year. And we're going to see a pretty significant inflection as we get into the second half, especially with comms getting significantly easier in 4Q because 4Q of 2023 was a very difficult quarter. Can you, can you quantify that, Ivana? What, what kind of corporate profit growth are you looking for? Well, it really depends by sector. We covered the technology sector specifically. So within like some of, some of the more cyclical areas, like semiconductors, you're going to see explosive growth, right? Mm -hmm. Because earnings have really been under pressure anywhere you look outside of, of AI. Then on the software side, you're not going to see as big earnings surprises, but those companies have really struggled to keep up their high growth numbers, and I think that's going to really change as we get into second half. So it really depends like on the dif different, uh, even within sectors, the different subsectors. Mm -hmm. I think broadly for the economy, I think we're much more positive on commodities. We, I think those have bottomed, and, and we're seeing those, those prices inflect in the second half. So all of those companies are going to see pretty strong earnings. So I think it depends on the sector, but broadly speaking, we see it across the board. Mm. And of course, we're about to start getting earnings for um, this current earnings reporting season tomorrow morning. We get a bunch of big banks. Um, and so, Kara, as you look at these sectors and look at earnings growth that we sh should expect, um, I know that Ivana is tech focused. You look pretty broadly here. So where are you looking for that growth to come from? So I, I think we agree in that there are a lot of tailwinds heading into the second half of the year. And we've only just started to see corporate earnings inflect. I mean, if you remember, corporate earnings bottomed in the third quarter of last year. So we're only a couple of quarters into this resurgence. Now, we do think that having a quality bias, given the, some of the continued headwinds with higher interest rates, having that quality bias really helps. And we also expect it to continue to kind of broaden out a little bit. This has sort of been a theme we've been talking about. It's been happening very slowly, right? So last year was so dominated by the Magnificent Seven. But we're starting to see some mid-cap, some smaller cap names start to participate in this. And I think we'll see that continuing as we continue to see growth in the broad economy. In terms of, you know, Ivana, you mentioned uh, you sounded pretty bullish on semis. A lot of investors are. Any, any specific names you, you, would, you would think this is a good time to commit capital? So we still really like Nvidia. That's our top uh, top. Which holder. is that a bit of a correction here? Yeah, yeah, I think it's a it's a pretty decent entry point for the stock. We like AMD as well as Marvell. They all play in different areas. Marvell is one that does not get enough attention, by the way. Which is also at a not Nvidia like, but a strong run as well. Yeah. So we we yeah. do a lot of work on the value chain, and we we are finding a lot of value in other aspects in addition to processing, like networking, like liquid cooling, like power management. So all of those areas are a little less talked about than the processing side and offer pretty attractive investment opportunities. Mm -hmm. And sort of linked to that, something that we've talked about, but not necessarily as an investable theme, but we've talked about the challenge, the power challenge that comes with AI and you know supplying the needed power to the grid to do all of that compute. So how do investors sort of take advantage of that? 
So on the power side, there are a lot of different ways to play this theme. We do see data center demand growing at a pretty significant rate. We believe that data center will grow from 2.5% of the market of the power generation market today to over 7 to 8% uh, by 2027. So this is going to be a pretty significant driver for power gen specifically. So we like to play it on the utility side. That's where we see the most, uh, the most upside. Uh, demand has been very flat for this company. So a lot of them went even through bankruptcy. So we see a lot of opportunities there in terms of looking for more value and quality plays to, to Carol's point. So, um, so that's one area. Uh, another area would be on the component side. So there are companies like more industrial companies that provide power um, generation, uh, either equipment or uh, electronic components like Eaton would be an example uh, of those companies. So there, there's a pretty broad set of companies that play, that play mm. in the power gen space. And we do see actual investment opportunities based on that theme. And Kara, do you, you share that optimism about tech or at least certain verticals and sectors? There are certainly some areas. There are other areas of tech that are feeling a little rich right now. If you look at sort of valuations by sector, for instance, technology is the only area where you have valuations that are running well above historical averages. Now, a good portion of it is very warranted, mm. right? Operating margins have improved. Earnings um, are really coming back and having a lot of momentum. But I think it is an area where you have to be really careful where you're really leaning into. Mm. And speaking of being careful, um, you mentioned going down to sort of mid cap, small caps. Small caps have really underperformed yeah. this year. So if you're looking within small caps, how do you make sure that you're not getting that interest rate exposure that has really smacked them? Well, I think that's where, as you're deciding to go down cap, mid cap is a little bit easier to kind of hide in. Uh, because small caps definitely do have that headwind with the higher interest rates. Um, there are opportunities there, but I also think that's where you have to be really careful about quality. So if you're finding small caps, overall valuations that are extraordinarily low, so expectations are really low, but if you can also find names that have strong balance sheets, reliable earnings, that's where you can be a little bit more protected from that high rates going forward. All right, Kara, Ivana, thank you guys both for joining us. Appreciate thank you. it. While we're wrapping up today's market domination, don't go anywhere. We've got you covered with all the action following the closing bell. Stay tuned for market domination overtime.
There's the closing bell on Wall Street, and now it is market domination overtime. We're joined by Jared Blickery to get you up to speed on the action from today's session. Let's start with where the major averages ended up. The Dow off the highs of the session did recover, of course, from earlier sellings down. It looks like about three points to end the day, but we'll see here as we get the sort of settle happening. But the S&P and the Nasdaq a little bit more comfortably in the green than the Dow here, up three quarters of one percent for the S&P, up about one point one and two thirds of a percent for the Nasdaq. Let's call it. And what's been interesting today is as we look at that more benign PPI data that sort of helped reassure investors. You see not much movement in the ten-year yield, up just two basis points, four point five eight percent after that very large move that we got up yesterday. So that sort of allowing perhaps the gains to happen, also not hurting matters, the fact that we saw some weakness in crude oil, which is something that has been periodically an obstacle for equities to push higher as of late, uh, trading today down about two-thirds of a percent, 85.64. Now we've got Jared with a closer look at today's action. Hey, Jared. Thank you, Julie. Let me show you the NASDAQ 100 here, a picture worth a thousand words. It has all been about tech today. Uh, Apple up 4%. This is the biggest uh, gainer in about 11 months. Let me just show you a two-year chart so you can see where we're coming from here. Really launched off of an important support level, and this was uh, potentially a double top. Look like, looks like that has been averted, at least for today. Uh, Apple has been down 11% this year, so if it is now gaining, if it's part of the mix, uh, you can only imagine uh, a lot of other stocks are going to be helped by this in tech. NVIDIA up 4%. That is not quite a record high for NVIDIA. Let me show you the year to date there. Just a little bit off of that, but it's been trading basically sideways in basing, which is also bullish. Um, let's check out the sector action. I said tech was in the forefront. So is consumer discretionary, and so is communication services. So the mega cap sector is really outperforming. Industrials, real estate, just a little bit of contribution there. Financials trade to the downside. Uh, those were the biggest losers today. And uh, let me just go back to the NASDAQ 100. Wanted to show you one thing with Amazon. Just finally reached another record high. This is the first record high since 2021. And that has been a long time coming. So a lot to celebrate in the mega cap sector and arena there. Finally, let's take a look at our leaderboard. Not surprisingly, New York Fang in the forefront, but also Korean stocks bouncing back, chip stocks, uh, also ARC funds. Let me just leave you on uh, unprofitable tech showing a lot of green today. Coinbase up nearly 5%, Josh. Jared, thank you. Tech leading the way on Wall Street, the NASDAQ top performer, but looking at the broader market, stocks posting a modest gains after the CPI-fueled sell-off on Wednesday. Yahoo Finance's Alexander Canal joining us now with the day's takeaways. Ali. Yeah, so I'm calling this the post-CPI hangover as markets digest what we saw from that hotter-than-expected CPI print. And like you were just saying, I mean, what a difference a day makes. We closed the day green across the board, NASDAQ leading the way, boosted by Apple's big day. But a lot of this also comes as the market digests the, the future of the rate cut policy for the Fed. Also, that cooler-than-expected producer price index that really helped alleviate a lot of the concerns that we saw from that hotter CPI print. Perhaps that that inflation is not as widespread as we thought, and it could point to more improved inflation numbers for the month of April. In other market news, we did see a steep drop in the VIX, otherwise known as the fear index. Short-term yields like the two-year also giving back some of their gains from yesterday. We do still have the 10-year trading above 4.5%. Now, strategists have said the next technical level to watch is 4.7%, and perhaps we could see a bit of a pullback from there. But it does seem like bond traders are preparing for a scenario where we potentially Potentially don't see any rate cuts this year. And if that's the case, we could see the 10 year push above 5%. So okay. that's just something yeah. we'll have to continue to watch. BlackRock's Rick Reader, though, told us this show in terms of where he sees it headed. Okay. He said he sees it headed dead at 425 as the year progresses, provided yes. that inflation data cooperates. Well, and he still says yeah. the Fed wants to cut rates yeah. a right. couple of times, but we are seeing an increasing number of Wall Street strategists who are decreasing the number of cuts they're projecting. And I thought it was interesting that they made, they didn't wait for PPI, right? right? Which it has more of the components that go into the PCE forecast, right? They didn't wait. After CPI yesterday, mm -hmm. they came out with their notes and they said, 
we're not expecting as many cuts, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. also this morning, we got some new updates. Both Deutsche Bank and Bank of America now pushing their rate cut expectations to December. So that means one rate cut at the very end of the year. And they previously saw easing beginning in the summer. Wells Fargo, another one, pushing back their expectations, sees easing beginning in September. And this comes as investors, too, are pricing in less rate cuts. Investors just see two interest rate cuts in 2024. That's down from the seven that we saw earlier in January. So I do think this is going to be a continued debate. And it's not just about CPI. It's also all the other data that we've been getting, which has been coming in very strong, the jobs data being included. Mm -hmm. So I think the more uh, data we get, and if that data comes in strong, the more recalibration we're going to see when it comes mm -hmm. to those interest rates. And then tomorrow, earnings day. Here yeah, big, big day for earnings, the yeah. big bangs. We've already seen some names trickle in, run through runway, CarMax. They were top training tickers on Yahoo Finance following those results. And the big theme here is that even if the Fed does not cut rates, that's not really the story because earnings has been so incredibly strong. Our markets reporter, Josh Schaefer, he has a pretty good story on the Yahoo Finance homepage right now about how multiple strategists see the S&P 500 closing above 5,400 at the end of the year, even if the Fed does not cut rates, again, driven by earnings. That's a result of this strong economy and the strong economic backdrop. You guys were also previously discussing mm. that with your playbook guests. And right. I think that's a, a, a big story that's going to play out through the second half we of had, the year. So the banks tomorrow, I mean, we'll see. We had, we had RBC's Gerard Cassidy, you know, kind of high dean of the bank analysts. He was broadly positive high with dean, us. I yeah. like that. I mean, he kind of, you know, possible, you asked him, Julie, for revisions. He mm. said he seemed kind of but certainly possible, and obviously that would you know typically be be good news for stock prices. Like J P Morgan, which reports tomorrow. Yeah, the, ba the yeah. banks will be an interesting one, especially yeah. since we've been operating in this high interest rate environment. It'll be. I'm yeah. curious. It's to a see mixed what those bag for, the, yeah, for those names. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sally. Thank Thanks, you. Appreciate Sally. it. Well, that good news on inflation, the latest PPI reading showing that wholesale prices increased less than expected. And it came, of course, after yesterday's hotter than expected CPI print. For more on what this new data could mean for rate cuts, we're bringing in Jeffrey Lacker, former Richmond Fed president and Mercatus Center senior affiliated scholar at George Mason University. Jeff, thank you so much for being uh, with us. So everybody's trying to figure out what the Fed is going to do. I'm quite sure the Fed included is trying to figure out what they want to do. Uh, Rick Reeder of BlackRock earlier said to us, the Fed wants to be able to cut here and probably cut a couple of times. Do you agree with that assessment? And I guess, will they then be able to cut a couple of times given the recent data? I agree that they do seem to be anxious to get started on cutting rates. Um, it looks like they're positioning to do so at the first time it's credible for them to do so. But uh, I think they're out a little bit over their skis. And I, I think they've got they went a little too far last year in encouraging views about rate cuts this year. And I, I think this recent um, stretch of inflation data over the last three months is a good reason why um, they would have stood themselves in better better um, if they'd uh, been a little more cautious last year. Um, it still is quite plausible that inflation uh, sticks right around here. This would be three to four percent, three and a half to four on the CPI, and maybe three to three and a half on the PCE core. And if, if it just persists at this level, um, they could easily not get any rate cuts in this year at all. What, what needs to happen, Jeffrey, to, to get inflation back to target? Um, you know, does does unemployment have to, to ramp? Is that what needs to happen? No, it doesn't. But uh, policy needs to be restrictive enough. The key uh, with monetary policy, as always in a situation like this, is getting is encouraging people to delay spending uh, because it's the excess of spending over the economy's capacity that drives inflation. Uh, you don't need to reduce spending so much as to cause a recession, but you do need to restrain it enough. And the signs are that there's a good chance that, that Fed policy isn't terribly restrictive right now um, and isn't going to do the trick in getting inflation down. Uh, the way to think of this is that the, there's a real interest rate uh, that's relevant to um, people's incentives to delay spending. And uh, What's relevant to uh, that, what, what goes into that calculation, is the current inflation rate, not what the inflation rate's going to be at the end of the SCP in the long run 
uh, when inflation's back down to 2%. With inflation running around 3.5% right now, I think um, you know there's a good case can be made that, that policy is not terribly tight right now. Well, even if policy isn't terribly tight right now, I, I guess there's also always the perennial question of how effective it would be even if it were tighter. In other words, the things that we're still seeing increase in price are maybe things that aren't as affected by rate policy, you know, if you're talking about things like medical costs or healthcare spending, for example. Well, there's always some components of the basket of goods that um, consumers and businesses uh, purchase that go up more rapidly than others. Um, so there's always relative price changes. Uh, but you want the overall uh, level of prices, the average, the value of money over time to be stable. And sure, uh, driving up uh, real interest rates might not cut into what people spend on health care and might not uh, diminish the sense, the extent to which medical prices are, are exceeding inflation. But uh, there's going to be something that people cut back on and firms cut back on. And so, yeah, something will, will give and the overall inflation rate will fall. I've heard some folks, Jeffrey, seem to suggest maybe they take some comfort in in that the PCE is somewhat lower. What, what do you make of that argument? Well, so there's methodological reasons why they're different. And so, yeah, you, you got to take that translation into account. But even with that, with the today's PPI, it looks like the next core figure is going to be at around 3% at a, on a month over month um, at an annual rate. So it looks like over the last three months, we've had core inflation measured by the PCE at above 3%. Um, and that's not a good number. That's not nearly close enough to 2% to give them comfort. And it's worth pointing out that um, they had these, this stretch of, of six months of good inflation numbers in the second half of last year. We've had three months of, of adverse inflation numbers. Uh, the good numbers were the, the consequence of goods prices coming down, um, but service prices just haven't kept. Uh, service and price inflation hasn't uh, moderated the, to the extent they want. It's driven by wage setting, and, and wage rates are still going up at a rate that isn't consistent with inflation coming down to 2%. Um, they may fall, but it's, that's an open question. And with the labor market tight and tighter than expected at this point, um, it, it seems clearly plausible that inflation sticks around 3% rather than falls to 2%. And I think they need to prepare people for what the Fed would do in that case. And I, I, I think it would be better uh, for them in the longer run if they back away from this language about getting how many rate cuts they're going to get in this year, whether they're going to start cutting rates this year. The end of the year is a bit of an artificial horizon after all. Well, and also, is there any chance that the Fed would actually um, pull on some of its other levers, its balance sheet, for example, if you think that policy isn't sufficiently restrictive right now, is that one way that they could do it without making a change to rates? I, you know, I'd hope that they'd, they'd uh, keep up a healthy rate of um, rolling off the balance sheet. Um, they seem, uh, at the last meeting, they discussed um, whether to uh, reduce the rate at which that's rolling off. I, I don't see the necessity of doing that. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, the balance sheet is something of a sideshow. The, the effects are likely to be small, uncertain, imprecisely estimated. They've got a ways to go before balance sheet reductions would provide much of um, a disinflationary effect. I think the the, the main game in, in town here is the interest rate setting. Right, definitely, and the communication about it. Jeffrey Lacker, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Great, thanks. Thank you. Our mortgage rates are moving towards 7% as markets digest the latest data. We'll talk about the latest housing hurdles on the other side. More market domination over time coming up.
Take a look at shares of Morgan Stanley sliding more than 5% on the day. The bank's wealth unit reportedly facing an investigation from several federal agencies over its efforts to prevent possible money laundering by wealthy clients. The Wall Street Journal saying the probe is centered around whether the firm is doing enough to vet potential clients and also says Morgan Stanley is addressing concerns from regulators, but that didn't seem to be enough to uh, keep the stock from falling in today's session in reaction to this. Um, and according to the journal, it's a number of different regulatory departments, including the SEC, the OCC, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, and the Tre and other Treasury Department offices. Yeah, it sounds like it, it basically boils, boils down to uh, the Morgan Stanley, um, is getting, again, according to the journal, the question is whether they've been kind of sufficiently investigating the identities of prospective clients and then kind of where their wealth is actually coming from. Right. And obviously, for investors, that wealth unit um, in focus. I mean, it is now Morgan Stanley's biggest unit. It does about you know, it's responsible, Do I think, for about half of Morgan Stanley's revenue. They've made a series of acquisitions in that area, so top of mind for investors. And no surprise when a headline like that hits, you're going to see a reaction. Right, and it includes uh, the SEC looking into, for example, um, a client who's a billionaire with ties to Russia who had been sanctioned by the United Kingdom. All of this part of what's known in the financial services business as KYC, know your customer. And there are a lot of regulations around financial mm -hmm. services and who they can do business with who are not on various lists of sanctioned individuals. Yeah, a story we'll keep an eye on. Yeah. Moving on, mortgage rates edging higher on the back of stronger than expected inflation data. Elevated rates keeping affordability out of reach for prospective home buyers. Here with more on how costs are adding up in the housing market. Let's get to Logan Monashami, Housing Wire lead analyst. analyst. Logan, always good to see you. So I'm looking here, Logan, Mortgage News Daily tells me the 30-year fixed. We're back up to 7.34%. Uh, where do we go from here, Logan? You know, 6, 12 months ago, 12 months from now, where do you think we're at? Well, it really depends on the labor market. I think if jobless claims start to increase, then the 10-year yield and mortgage rates will fall with it. If uh, not, we're just going to be staying kind of at these levels or even even higher. Um, and I, I think the labor market is the key for mortgage rates. And if mortgage rates could just get down towards 6%, the housing market could you know hold some of these uh, sale gains. But I think another positive story for 2024 that wasn't the case last year is that the spreads between the 10-year yield and 30-year mortgage, uh, they, they're improving this year. Last year, that wasn't the case. The Silicon Valley banking crisis made the spreads worse. So we might have been a uh, half a percent higher today if that wasn't the case. Logan, there, even as we are seeing maybe mortgage rates forecast to come down a little bit this year, there is also sort of increasing attention being paid to the other costs of owning a home that are not coming down, things like insurance, things like property taxes. Um, how much of an obstacle is that? And maybe even in some cases a hidden obstacle that homeowners aren't entirely bargaining on. We have an issue in Florida where uh, this might be the ground zero of does climate change really impact the housing market materially enough to where uh, parts of the country might not be livable for uh, a lot of uh, uh, home buyers. Um, if your insurance costs are going up 20, 30 percent and you're at a risk of a hurricane, uh, and it's very difficult to get insurance, that's a problem. And I think that's 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 going to be a story with us for many decades to come. Places like Texas, you know, that rely on property taxes uh, as home prices have gone up, there's a sticker shock for a lot of homeowners uh, and a, a, a lot of angry homeowners as well. So the total cost of housing is not just home prices accelerating, not just mortgage rates, but you got to put property taxes and insurance into the, into the equation. So it's Pricey for a lot of people, especially for first-time home buyers that finance more than 90% of their more uh, home purchases. And, and Logan, another issue I want to touch on is inventory. What, what does inventory look like right now? Now, this is the good story for 2024. That wasn't the case last year. Last year, new listings data was trending at the lowest levels ever recorded in history. Inventory didn't go anywhere. Home sales were at record lows and home prices we're appreciating, not a very healthy market. This year, active inventory is growing, new listings data is growing. It's not by much. There's no silver tsunami or anything like that happening, but it's good enough to give uh, people more choices. This means this will put uh, pressure on price growth. Uh, but to me, that's a healthier market this year that wasn't the case last year. And Logan, we haven't had a chance to catch up with you since the um, settlement with the National Retail uh, Realtors Association. and you know, sort of trying to figure out what effect this is going to have on commissions, on buyers and sellers commissions. 
What's your estimation of the effect that that is going to have on the overall housing market? I, I, I always will believe that there's going to be a huge question mark for the buyer now because the buyer has been able to finance their home purchases through the selling equity that has been created through trillions of dollars of equity built in, in the housing market over the decades. And now they don't know if uh, the seller is going to pay for it or not. So I think that will be something that we need to see at least 12 to 18 months of data to see how does that impact the buyer. Of course, the seller gets to keep a little bit more of his money, but most sellers are buyers. So then that seller is going to be on the other side of the equation. So for right now, big question mark to see what it is, but definitely for buyers, they're just not a 100% sure uh, how much money they need to bring in. Uh, and I think that's going to take time for it to work itself out on, on the visuals of how that's going to impact the home buying season. Logan, always great to have you on the show. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Time now for to watch Friday, April 12th, starting off on the earnings front. Earnings season is kicking off with reporting from the financial sector. JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, Citigroup, BlackRock, and State Street all set to report first quarter earnings. Moving over to the economy, the latest consumer sentiment rating for April coming out in the morning. And economists forecast that number will tick down slightly. And this is after an unexpected rise last month in the highest reading since 2021. And finally, taking a look at the Fed, we'll be getting some more Fed commentary tomorrow afternoon from Fed Presidents Rafael Bostic and Mary Daly. is following new comments today from Boston Fed President Susan Collins. Collins saying the recent inflation data has eased concerns about the, quote, imminent need to change. Rates. Coming up, an attack on Israeli assets by Iran or its proxies could be imminent, according to U.S. officials, what this could mean for the price of oil on the other side.
New reports from U.S. officials show an attack on Israeli assets by Iran could be imminent. Investors and energy traders have been worried about a wider Middle East war. Could this be it? Let's ask Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman. You know, we, this has been talked about in recent days, ever since Israel struck a target in Damascus, right. an Iranian target. And now there's been talk about, you know, and inevitably, it would probably continue to go back and forth. Right. In, uh, Israel killed an Iranian commander in that strike in Damascus. And uh, this is a report in the Wall Street Journal today uh, by Warren Strobel. Shout out to Warren Strobel. Used to work with him. Great reporter there. Um, you know, the U.S. intelligence community has gotten some of these right. Uh, they uh, supposedly told Moscow mm -hmm. uh, that this that this terrorist right. attack was coming in. They even predicted it could be on a uh, on a concert venue, and then it happened. So, uh, and they also, of course, were correct that Russia was going to invade Ukraine in 2022. So they've gotten gotten these things right. So it seems worth paying attention to. Um, you you know, uh, Israel and Iran have been fighting this shadow war, kind of shadow war, for a long time. And uh, I mean, if you look at what's been happening with oil prices, I mean, we've seen oil prices drifting up about fifteen dollars per barrel since uh, since December. That coincides with things that have been happening in the Middle East. These Houthi attacks on cargo in the Red Sea, which is forcing a lot of the mm. ships to go around. Uh, and you know, ever since this war broke out in last October, I mean, the biggest concern for markets has been how big is this going to get? If it, if it remains contained between Israel and Hamas in that part of the Gaza Strip, it, it, it is a less, less of a problem for global markets than if Iran gets involved, than if Saudi Arabia gets involved, that it starts to affect global energy supply. So every time I hear a report like this, it, it, it gets my attention. Mm. And if, if Iran does something, um, I, I mean, you, I think you would see an immediate reaction in oil prices, even if it's just the fear premium. Uh, but oil prices are more important now than they usually are because Joe Biden trying to get reelected and he is doing everything he can to keep oil prices and gasoline prices down, including some things uh, most people don't see, such as sanctions policy toward Venezuela, things like that. We're, we're, we're only talking about a tiny amount of oil, but Biden is doing everything he can to keep as much supply on the market and prices down. And obviously he hopes this doesn't escalate. Yep. Uh, big headline. We'll keep watching. Rick, thank you. Yep. Up next, data analytics company Juicer wants to revolutionize restaurant revenue management with the help of dynamic pricing. Talking to the CEO next.
Juicer wants to help restaurants stay competitive with the power of dynamic pricing. Simply put, Juicer helps restaurants to adjust their prices depending on demand, the goal of maximizing revenue and drawing in customers during less busy periods. Juicer just secured more than $5.3 million in funding to accelerate its growth. And here with more, we're joined by Ashwin Kamlani, Juicer co-founder and CEO. Ashwin, it is good to see you. So um, when we talk about dynamic pricing, Ashwin, in layman's terms, what we mean is, you know, when I buy a burger, Ashwin, the price of that is going to gonna it's going to go up or down depending on when during the day I buy it. That's true. Um, although it depends on where you're buying it. So actually, if you think about it, in channels like Uber Eats or DoorDash, this is something that the consumer has been experiencing for many years now. So the consumer already knows that when they open up an app like DoorDash or Uber Eats, that they could order a burger on a Tuesday afternoon. But if they order that same exact burger on a Friday night where it's busy, they may end up paying a lot more. And that's because Uber Eats and DoorDash have flexed up their delivery fees during those times. So the consumer has been conditioned to understand that the same exact meal can change depending on when they order it. And I guess I've been conditioned too, Ashwin, because I experience that when I'm doing an Amazon delivery, for example, where it says, do you want to get it on this day? It might cost a little bit less or we'll give you even a credit or what have you. Um, all of that said, when we recently got the news that Wendy's was going to employ dynamic pricing, there was sort of this firestorm around that. Why do you think that is? I actually think that was a huge misunderstanding. Um, I think Kirk Tanner, who was at Pepsi for 32 years and was in the hospitality industry for about one month before he was telling investors why he was spending $20 million on digital menus, I think all he wanted to say was that having a digital menu would give them the flexibility to run more offers throughout the day when things were slower. Now, it was the New York Post that turned that around and said, Wendy's to implement Uber-style surge pricing by 2025, and that's where you saw the blow up in, in, the, you know, in the public. And I think that's because the public knows that when you get in an Uber and it's busy, sometimes you can pay two or three or even four times what the normal price is because things are busy. That is not at all what Kirk Tanner or Wendy's wanted to say when they were implying that they would run offers throughout the day. It seems, Ash, when, you know, with dynamic pricing, is there sort of a, a kind of delicate balance, though, you kind of have to walk here? I mean, consumers are already sensitive, obviously, to these elevated inflationary pressures. You're not careful. You could really alienate them. I agree 100 percent. And so let me make one thing clear. When we do price changes in channels like Uber Eats or DoorDash and we're doing small changes up or down, we're talking about a few cents here or there. Um, so I've seen some some people in the media um, relating this to price gouging. And I would argue that's really not the case. Um, you know, in an airline, you have prices fluctuating because they have a limited number of seats to sell. And in a hotel, you have a limited number of rooms to sell. Now, in a restaurant before COVID, you had a number of seats that you could fill in that dining room. That was your restriction of capacity. But that has changed now because of COVID and so much delivery and what we call in the industry off-premise dining that's occurring. The new measurement of a restriction on a, a restaurant's capacity is actually their throughput. How much food can they get out of that kitchen in a half hour or one hour period? So the objective here is if it's a really busy Friday night, what the restaurant typically would do is just shut off those channels because they'd rather focus on the people in the restaurant. But if they can make 25 cents or 50 cents more on one particular item because it's a busy Friday night and continue to serve those customers who are willing to pay a premium for that convenience, that's really um, the thinking here. However, I'll just highlight that the focus of what we do here is offering dynamic discounts and offers, particularly on digital menu boards, kiosks, drive throughs even movie theaters, stadiums, and concert venues. And there are a lot of customer benefits from that. Well, and this is something that is not entirely new, right? I mean, we've had, particularly I can think of the fast food industry, offering deals at various times of year, seasonally at least. So what's different now about this latest phase? Is it the ability to have that digital menu that you can change quickly? Is it the data at uh, your disposal when you're offering advice on how to do this? How, how is it sort of moving into the next phase? That's a great question. And so we've seen certain forms of dynamic pricing in the restaurant industry for a long time. The consumer already accepts that 
they might pay a different price for a, a menu item at lunchtime versus dinner. You have lunch versus dinner menus. Um, you also have happy hours, right? And you have a situation where I've walked into a restaurant at 7.05, and then I found out the happy hour ended at 7. But I understand that they're offering those discounted prices during that time because it's a slower period. And most consumers are quite understanding about that concept. Now, when I come in at 7.05 and I realize I just missed happy hour, I don't get upset and walk out because now I have to pay more for the same exact food. And, and so really what we're doing here is taking that concept of happy hour, which is intended to help the restaurant during a period that would normally be slow, and making it less static. So you might have a favorite restaurant and you know that happy hour is every day from seven to eight. Now, what could happen in this new world is that your favorite restaurant might have a slow Thursday night between eight and nine when they're normally busy, and suddenly they could spin up a last minute spontaneous happy hour and message all of their customers, hey, good news, you know, we're kind of slow today. If you come in during the next hour, you can get great prices that we don't normally offer. And that's what happened in hotels and travel as well. When e-commerce came to hotels and airlines, that's what allowed the industry to start launching last minute deals and newsletters where you could find great deals. That was never you know, possible before when prices were printed on a brochure. It's really interesting stuff. Ashwin, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Swifties rejoice. Taylor Swift is back on TikTok. The singer's catalog of music has returned to the app just a few months after it was removed alongside several other artists' work. How did it happen? Alexander Knall joins us now with more. So what? why did it go off and why is it back? So it went off because Universal Music Group, which is one of Hollywood's top record labels, they got into a dispute with TikTok over a licensing contract that was about to expire. So on February 1st, they pulled all of its artists off of the TikTok app that included Taylor Swift music, along with songs from Drake, Justin Bieber, Adele. So. For users, that's totally been missing from the app. Now, UMG did name quite a few sticking points with its negotiations with TikTok, why this happened. That included three critical issues, such as appropriate compensation for artists and songwriters, protections from artificial intelligence, and online safety for TikTok users. But it's believed that Swift was able to circumvent this because she owns her master recordings. Universal Music Group is simply the distributor of her music. So there are reports out there that she was able to basically go and negotiate her own licensing deal with TikTok that's separate from UMG. And the timing here, I mean, it couldn't be more perfect. Her new album, The Tortured Poets Department, that comes out next week, April 19th. So I'm sure she wanted her fans to be able to access the music and the new album on TikTok and all of these other platforms. She's a great marketer. I feel like this was a play for that. At this point, you know, we'll see where those negotiations go with the record label and TikTok moving forward because this is an issue and something that people want access to, but UMG really putting its foot mm. down here mm. in terms of those I don't know. I can't imagine her sales would have been heard too much or listens would have been heard too much if she wasn't on there. I'm sure people hey. are still going to want to listen to it. I think You're so. right, Julie. But I do think as an artist, you know, you want that access you everywhere. You everywhere. can get it. Sure. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Ali. Appreciate it. Well, that'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell.
Easter Run Noodle Company hits grocery shelves nationwide. When I was a kid and I was like always trying to like hide my lunch or, you know, I just didn't want people to come over when my mom was making something particularly aromatic. <laughs> Fast forward to today where I get a chance to, you know, proudly put this in front of the, the country. The types of aromatic dishes Vanessa Pham once tried to hide from the world are now on full display in vibrant packaging on the shelves of major retailers. The brand's colorful journey is also on full display across the internet, thanks to Pham's now tell the world attitude. Every time I go into the grocery store, I always got to take the phone out and do like the selfie video. It always feels surreal. Amsam is a sauce and noodle startup partnering with prominent Asian chefs to offer premium authentic flavors. This isn't your usual microwavable instant noodles you might think of. A huge step Vanessa and her sister Kim say is part of their personal mission to shake up ethnic aisles at grocery stores and bring these dishes to the mainstream. But the recipe to get here, well, it wasn't a simple one. A global pandemic, Silicon Valley banks collapse, and the challenges any 24-year-old would face leading a brand new startup all stood in the way of her vision and mission of spreading her values and culture through the love of food. Tell us what Am Sam means. Yes. I mean, that in itself just symbolizes so much of the mission. Am Sam is actually based on a Vietnamese word, Am Sam. And in Vietnamese, it means rowdy, rambunctious, riotous. It's actually a negative term. It's what our parents would use when they were trying to scold us. And Kim and I were really inspired by that energy. What if we kind of turn that on its head and celebrate that aspect of who we are? Mm -hmm. Um, and Om Sam is all about being proud and loud, especially when the stereotype of Asian Americans in America is kind of like submissive or docile. Om Sam is, is our true kind of energy and ethos and spirit. While hiking in Bolivia in 2018 with her more free-spirited sister, the once risk-averse fam decided to lean into what she felt was her true ethos and leave her steady consulting career behind. We instantly circled around the mission and the industry, mm -hmm. and the mission is to educate on multitudes within Asian America, mm -hmm. um, honor and celebrate Asian cuisines and flavors, and the industry just had to be food because for us, it was a love language. It was how we first like really learned to engage with our culture as Vietnamese Americans and daughters of refugees. With nothing more than what the two sisters had in the bank, they set out on their mission to create something unique. Embracing their roots was a catalyst to create Am Sam as they saw an opportunity to tap into the ethnic food market, which is set to reach $84.7 billion by 2034. And investors saw the opportunity too, as a number of them, including the co-founder of the luggage company Away, Jen Rubio, founder of the online wedding platform Zola, Shanlin Ma, and former Whole Foods executive turned VC founder Ellie Truesdale of New Fair Partners helped fund the Fam Sisters' vision. For Fam, embracing her personality, well, that, that was how she learned to lead the brand. Do you see yourself as more of a risk forward uh, leader now? Do you feel like you're tapping in to that mission? I would say that the person who I was when we were first building Omsom is very different than the person I am today. I think my proud and loud has actually been embracing who I am, which is very sensitive, very empathetic, mm -hmm. lots of feelings, yeah. um, and learning to see that that's a huge strength as a leader mm -hmm. if I don't make myself wrong for that or suppress that. You also founded the company at such young age. I think you were, what, 24? I was 24, 24 a baby, oh a baby, yeah. How did you push through that noise and say, I may be young, but I'm making a difference? Yeah. I would say the loudest noise was actually my own self-doubt mm -hmm. at the time. And so, so much of this journey has been actually working with my kind of inner narratives and dialogue. And now I think I'm kind of my own hype woman. So a hype woman with a core team who have helped her create not just food products, but an environment fueled by the brand's identity and fam's own energetic outlook, something she has embedded in the culture. Everybody here is incredibly talented, incredibly driven, 
and I think enlivened by the mission of AMSAM. And I absolutely lean on the team. I think, you know, a strong leader must and should trust and empower those that work with them. I learn from the team every single day. Bam's journey in starting AMSAM has definitely been a learning experience. As they sought out the right manufacturing partner, which they found in Chicago, back in Brooklyn, another huge lesson came their way. How to launch a specialty food business in the middle of a global pandemic. When we started out building AMSAM, we were just wide-eyed. We didn't know what could come. And before we even launched, the first big challenge came. Do we launch? in the midst of this pandemic at the start of it, or do we pause and wait it out? And what we realize is that folks during this time are gonna be at home, they're gonna be wanting to feel a sense of connection and home, and we felt like you know, that's what Amsam's all about. And I think we did make the right decision, despite some folks warning us uh, that it could be a, a difficult time. Who were those folks, those investors, those people who backed you? How did you push over that? One of my philosophies as, as a leader is, you know, you've got this whole kind of network of folks, whether they're investors or, you know, other folks. And I believe it's so important to, you know, take in their input, their advice and their experience like a sponge. But at the end of the day, coming together with, you know, your, your team, centering your values and finding the best path forward for the company is really, you know, that power is yours. We decided this was the time that we wanted to bring this company to the world. Just three years after launching during COVID, FAM faced another major obstacle. Regulators shut down Silicon Valley Bank. The FDIC has taken control of the bank deposits. So what's the fallout, the ripple effects? Leaving the startup without access to their capital right before the brand was scheduled to launch their second product line, Saucy Noodles. Nothing can really prepare you for that type of, you know, uncertainty. I immediately had to figure out what our options were. And at the same time, Kim and I started working together on how we wanted to communicate what was going on to our community. So we wanted to center our values around transparency um, and around bringing them in. Fam and her sister were transparent with their community in a way that you might expect from the young founders on social media. We did not know what would happen in the coming days. And so we put our heads together that Saturday morning and wrote something from the heart. Running a proud and loud business doesn't always mean being celebratory. So let's talk about how SVB's collapse poses a major existential threat to many small businesses, including Omsom. I think while we were still very scared and nervous, we felt deeply heartened by the people that showed up for us. Talk about what values you hold closest to you as a leader. One of the values that I've really centered in my journey as a leader is being heart forward, which is something that I don't think was necessarily historically celebrated in leadership. You know, it was about being you know, decisive, being kind of just like leading with certainty and confidence, sometimes at the expense of your humanity. And I, I feel like at the early stages of my journey, I tried that on and I was always making mistakes when I was in that, you know, headspace of being something that I wasn't. And so the last couple of years, I've started to accept more of who I am in my leadership. If I'm, you know, working on something in my own journey, I, I'm open to sharing that. And I hope that that kind of invites people to feel confident and accepted in who they are at Omsom too. When your team thinks of you as a leader, what do you hope is the message that you're getting across? I really hope that every everybody at Omsom feels valued for who they are and what they bring to the table, and that they feel they have room to learn to sometimes make mistakes. It's about celebrating your truth and exactly what makes you you. I want Omsom to be the type of place where People are learning and expanding, but also feeling great pride in their kind of natural strengths. Fam and her team are determined to fill a white space. Think Kava and how it's setting out to fill the white space for fast, casual Mediterranean food. Or what Chipotle has done for fast, casual Mexican cuisine. And now Amsam aims to fill the void for premium, authentic Asian flavors in the packaged food market. 
That market is expected to grow around 50% globally by 2030. And while Amsam doesn't disclose its finances publicly, the suggested retail price for its saucy noodles and its cooking sauces range from nearly $4 to $5. Since launch, the brand has sold 4 million products and expanded its presence to over 2,000 stores without losing sight of its roots. Fam isn't satisfied yet, though. Far from it. She wants, in her own words, proud and loud Asian flavors to be mainstream. I want to see Amsam become a cultural force, a household name that continues to honor Asian American communities and flavors and culture every single day. I want us to be in homes across the country, but still hold that ethos and that heart that we do today. An ethos and heart that Pham and her sister inherited from their parents, who, as refugees, weren't able to take the same kinds of risks. Your parents must be so proud of you. What do you think they think about all that you have done? They tell us all the time, which I really appreciate. They tell us that we are honoring our family history by the work that we do. And because they're refugees and they've, you know, built the life we have today, I, it is my, you know, biggest life stream to honor them and do right by them. If there is one moment that really felt like, wow, I made it, we did it, what, what would that moment be? It's when we've shown the people who helped to get us here what we've done. And so it's really my grandparents. We were featured in a spread in El Vietnam and it's written in Vietnamese. So I cannot wait to bring it to them because they can read it and really understand that. And that'll be the moment I think when it really hits me, you know, what's what we've accomplished.